Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Final session of the day. Uh, we're going to hear from Nicholas Tollervy, who's going to tell us about lessons learned with Async I.O. Look, Ma, I wrote a distributed hash table. We should be planning for about five minutes of questions at the end. Microphones are in the aisle. All right, Nicholas. Thank you. Hi, so obviously my name is Nicholas. Uh, I'm a freelance Python developer from the UK, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent. And uh, this is an introduction to the async uh, that arrived in Python 3.4. Um, my only expectation of you is that you know some Python. So um, like I said, it's an introductory level talk. And what we'll do is we'll explore some core concepts um, of async IO. And I'll tell you the story about how uh, I used async IO to write a fun personal brain break type project, which is to write a distributed hash table, a DHT, uh, more of which I'll explain in a minute. Um, also, this isn't an exhaustive uh, um, uh, examination of async IO. And I'm simplifying a lot as well. Um, uh, my aim really is, is to arm you with enough information to continue exploring the module yourself when you, when you leave this talk. Um, it's also a bit of a personal pedagogical exercise. If I can explain myself in simple and easy to understand language, it demonstrates my own clarity of thought and understanding of async IO. So uh, I guess the first thing I should do is, is answer this question. Well, actually, I don't have to answer it because the Python docs do uh, for me. And they say, um, this module provides infrastructure for writing single-threaded concurrent code using coroutines, multiplexing I.O. access over sockets and other resources, running network clients and servers and other related primitives. I'm just seeing if the uh, caption has caught up with me yet. <laughs> now, while I understand all the terminology from the documentation that I've just read out to you, uh, it doesn't give me a practical feel about uh, how I might use, use, use the module. And this is what I want to explore today. And the other thing is, is that such documentation can make the module appear intimidating in sort of the realm of esoteric leet uber hackers like Trinity here, who's so leet that she speaks in fixed width courier font. <laughs> uh, see if you can figure out which font that uh, Neo speaks in. Anyway, we can do better than this. Keep it simple, stupid, is, is, is my philosophy here. <laughs> so what does async IO do? Well, as Trinity says, it lets you write code that concurrently handles asynchronous network-based IO. Um, so it's important to be clear about what this means, what I mean. So concurrency is when several things appear to happen simultaneously. Uh, asynchronous literally means not synchronized. So there's no way to tell when something may happen. Um, the network is, of course, the medium for communicating with other devices, usually via the internet. And IO is obviously short for input-output, when the program communicates uh, with the outside world. So the problem clearly stated for async IO is that messages arrive and depart via the network at unpredictable times. Async IO lets you deal with such interactions simultaneously. Um, so given this simple purpose of async IO, I want to place async IO into a sort of a practical context, which is where the distributed hash table comes in. So what is a distributed hash table? Um, I'm hoping you're all familiar with dictionaries in Python. We are, after all, at PyCon. Um, so uh, a dictionary is obviously a very simple key value data store. And a hash table is simply a synonym for dictionary in Python. It's a sort of a data dictionary. And by distributed, it's distributed because the whole is built from several independent yet related parts. So this abstract encyclopedia in my slides is in some way made up from volumes that are independent yet related to each other. And in our case, uh, the DHT is a distributed data structure consisting of many independent nodes collaborating over the network. Uh, DHT is also uh, decentralized. There's no node more important than any of the others. There's no client-server relationships. Um, it's basically a, a, a very loose peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes. So a distributed hash table is a peer-to-peer key value data store. Um, why would I want to be uh, interested in this? Well, it's a really interesting programming problem. And it, a DHT has some fascinating properties. Like I said, there's no single point of failure or control. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the algorithm that I'm using, uh, Kademlia, um, efficiently scales to a huge number of nodes. It has good handling of fluid network membership, a solid foundation for more complex services that you can build on top of the DHT. And Kademlia is also tested in the real world. So BitTorrent and Freenet uh, use, use Kademlia. Um, so, and guess what? Uh, distributed hash table nodes have to concurrently handle lots of asynchronous network-based I.O., which is the sweet spot for async I.O. 
So we have a context. Um, how does async I/O make all this work together? So let's introduce the core concepts that I mentioned earlier. The first one being the event loop. Um, and that is simply some code that keeps looping. Each iteration of the loop does two things. Uh, it pulls for I.O. events that occurred during the time it took to complete the previous iteration of the loop. Um, and it runs any callbacks that need to be run during this iteration of the loop. Uh, the loop also carries out various bits of housekeeping needed for callbacks that have yet to be executed. Um, but I think it's also important that we define polling and callbacks. So, polling. Polling is discovering the status of something external to the program. Um, in async I.O., that means network-related I.O. events. And a callback is code to be executed when some event has occurred um, that's been obviously detected by polling. And so the, the metaphor on the screen is that the kids are polling. They're saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? They're trying to work out what the status of their journey to grandma is. Why they can't just look out the window, I don't know. Um, I'll let you know when we get there creates a sort of a callback, i.e. the mother is promising to do something when some condition is met. It's important to note that polling takes place once during each iteration of the loop. Um, I.O. events discovered by polling determine which callbacks to execute during the current iteration of the loop. Um, all pending callbacks are executed one after the other, as you can see from the quote from PEP 315. Um, when that's the case, uh, the loop can't continue. It's, it's blocked. Um, so the next iteration cannot start until all the sequentially executed callbacks finish in, in some sense. So there's obviously something wrong here. Hang on a minute. It doesn't, this doesn't sound very concurrent. Well, unfortunately, concurrency is, a har is hard. And there's more than one way to do it. So uh, it's worth taking some time to examine um, why async I.O. works in the way that it does. So in the traditional threading model of concurrency, concurrent tasks can interfere with shared resources. So you'll see where this is going. Task A reads a record. Task B reads a record. Both A and B change the retrieved data in different ways. Task B writes its changes. Task A writes its changes. And unfortunately, task A has overwritten the record containing task B's changes. We have loss of data, which is something we do not want. So why not wait for one task to finish with the shared resource before letting the other tasks using it, use it? So uh, why not just act asynchronously to avoid interference? Act synchronously to avoid interference. That's important. So first do A, then B, followed by C, and so on. Um, this is easy to understand, and, and it's also deterministic, which is a good, good quality. Um, but uh, what happens if A needs to wait for something? Um, for example, a reply from a machine on the network. Well, in that case, uh, the program has to wait until A's network call completes. Um, and if that's the case, it can't continue with tasks B and C. It has to wait for A to complete. So given the situation in this slide, the program is described as blocked, like I said. And this is unacceptable if we're writing code that needs to react quickly to network-based events, uh, which is precisely the sort of program async I.O. is intended to help with. And so. I hope you're probably asking yourself, well, why not just get on with task B and C while we, ate, while we wait for the result for task A? Well, if you're asking that, well, bingo, you've got how async I.O. sort of works. So welcome to the most important slide of this talk. Async I.O. is event-driven. This means that network-based I.O. is non-blocking. How does this work? Well, the program does not wait for a reply from, a, from network calls before continuing. Programmers define callbacks to be run when the result of a network call is known. In the meantime, the program continues to poll for and respond to other network-related I.O. events. And callbacks execute during the iteration of the event loop immediately after the expected network I.O. event is detected. Confused? Well, don't be, because this is exactly how humans think about concurrency. So. We make plans. When the washing machine finishes, take the clothes and hang them out to dry. The washing machine finishes is an expected event. Hang the clothes out to dry is a sort of a callback. Instructions that tell you what to do when this expected event happens. How hard can this be, says the stock photo dude with the washing basket. And we also skip between things that we need to do while we wait for other things to happen. So I can squeeze the orange juice while I wait for the toast and the eggs uh, to cook. Um, we don't just put things into the microwave and stand there watching them for five minutes. We get on with other things. So as humans, we work on concurrent tasks, like preparing breakfast in a similar non-blocking manner. 
So this is the fundamental advantage of async I.O. We plan ahead for expected events by defining callbacks to be called when such events eventually occur. And in the meantime, we sequentially handle the callbacks related to other events that may happen in the intervening time. So async I.O. avoids potentially confusing and complicated threaded concurrency whilst retaining the benefits of strictly sequential code. So given this is an introductory talk, there are probably a few questions that, that need answering. Number one, how are asynchronous concurrent tasks created? How do such tasks pause while waiting for non-blocking network-based I.O.? And how are callbacks defined to handle the eventual result? For this, we need to understand coroutines, futures, and tasks. So core concept number two, coroutines. I'm going to try and attempt to explain coroutines in just three slides. Here we go. So a coroutine is simply an object representing activity that eventually completes. Um, it's also the name that we give to the function that returns such an object, and those functions are decorated. Um, coroutines are generators, so they lazily generate results. So calling a coroutine function doesn't start its execution. They may be suspended uh, using the yield from syntax, uh, allowing the event loop to get on with other things. They yield from other objects, so when the yielded from object has a result, the coroutine continues from the yield from statement that suspended it. This is called re-entry. And at the end of this chain of coroutines is an object that eventually returns a result or raises an exception, rather than yielding some other coroutine. So here you have some example code from my, uh, my DHT project. Um, this is a decorated coroutine method that handles an incoming HTTP request. Um, upstream, something is yielding from this coroutine um, in order to do something with the response that's returned at the end. Uh, this block of code will pause in two places by yielding from the coroutine created by the payload.read call, um, a method that reads the raw data posted as part of the request. In other words, it's reading data from, from the network. Um, and that's the first line of the try block there. Uh, and the code pauses again while waiting on the coroutine created by the self.process data method, uh, which itself will wait on other things such as uh, calling out to external databases and so on and so forth. Uh, when the task encapsulated in this coroutine is complete, the upstream coroutine, waiting on this one, gets the returned result and resumes execution from where it yielded from this coroutine. But what about callbacks? We, we know how asynchronous activity happens with coroutines, uh, but how do we handle the results? Well, call concepts three and four help us with that. A future represents a result that may not be available yet. Callback functions are added to a sort of a to-do list to be executed when the result is known. And we say that the future is resolved. Sounds like Doctor Who, this. And a task is simply a future that wraps a coroutine. Uh, the resulting object is realized automatically when the coroutine completes. So here's some more. Ex this is a numpty example code. Um, so what I do is I create a callback function, def handle resolve future. Um, and I then create the future, my future equals async io dot future. Um, and then I add the future to the callback list at the end of that code block. And then time passes. And at some later time in a coroutine that has a reference to my future, um, when the activity is done, uh, the future is resolved with the appropriate result. Um, but this is a little bit tedious to do and set up. So that's why we need tasks to take care of all the sort of boilerplate. Uh, the task object is automatically resolved when the coroutine completes. So the coroutine doesn't need to reference the associated task object in some way. Um, and in this example, I, I create the callback again. Um, I create a task um, referencing the slow coroutine operation. Um, I add uh, the callback to the task that's been created. And then, interestingly, at the end, I execute the code. And remember, coroutines are generators. Um, so by setting up and running the event loop. OK? So another perspective, I, I have a, a buddy called Terry Jones, who I used to work with um, at a startup called Fluid Info. And he likes to point out that when we're working with, uh, that we're used to working with um, first class functions. You know, We pass them into functions, and we return them as values from functions. Um, and futures and tasks, that. They're, they're like first-class function calls, uh, so we can also pass them into functions and return them as values as well. So I've bombarded you with rather a lot of information here, so let's just recap here. So an event loop 
uh, is looping code that polls for I.O. and manages event handling callbacks. A coroutine is an object that represents activity that eventually completes, or it's a decorated function that returns such an object. A uh, future represents a result that may not be available yet, and associated callbacks are executed when it resolves. And a task is, uh, is boilerplate uh, that wraps a coroutine. It's a future. Um, but it's realized when the coroutine completes. So given all this theory, how does async IO work in practice with my distributed hash table project? Um, so before we can explore that, we need to know a little bit about how distributed hash tables actually work. In fact, I'm going to say DHTs from now on, because it's a bit of a mouthful. So I mentioned that a DHT is made up of nodes, and the classic way to visualize this is with a clock face. And you'll see why in a moment, rather squashed clock face. Um, so each node has a unique ID that is within a set of all possible values uh, for a certain hash function. So for example, SHA-512. Um, the ID's value indicates the node's position in the clock face. And in this way, we can tell where the node is located in the abstract uh, distributed hash table network, um, who it is close to, and how far away nodes are from each other. So there's some notion of distance going on here. And data stored in the distributed hash table is a key value pair, obviously. And the key is turned into a hash, like I do in this, um, this fragment of code. And the value is stored at nodes whose IDs are close to the hash of the key. So it's similar to understanding where to look things up in a multi-volume encyclopedia. Um, articles are words, keys, uh, and associated definitions, values, um, that are stored in volumes that cover some particular alphabetical range. So aardvark belongs under A, and zebra belongs under Z, because I'm from the UK. So, how do nodes know where to look? Well, each peer maintains a local routing table that tracks the state of its peers. And all interactions result in the exchange of status information uh, between nodes, and that's how the routing table is first populated and how it's kept up to date as well. And the routing table splits up the clock face of nodes into buckets. And buckets contain the same number of peers. So in this simplified example, there are only two peers in each bucket. Uh, but buckets cover a smaller range the closer to the local node that they are. So uh, I'm at about half past one there. And as you can see, the buckets uh, get smaller in size as you get smaller in range as you get closer to me. Therefore, the local node knows more about closer nodes. And um, just so that you know, each node behaves according to some very simple rules uh, to react to the messages that it gets. Uh, it doesn't really matter what those rules are for, for this talk. Um, and so because it's a hash table, it's a dictionary, get and set are, are the basic operations that we need to do. Um, and lookup is a fundamental um, underlying activity for this, for this to happen. Um, it's how to work out which peers are to be contacted to get a value or which peers we need to contact to store a value. Um, and because we're doing this over the network, all interactions are asynchronous because we don't know when our peers are going to respond to us. And the lookup is also concurrent because several peers can be interrogated at once for, for this sort of information. So how does lookup work? Can you guess? Six degrees of separation is a nice um, simplification of this. Um, say I want to put a value with a key whose hash puts it in a position at around six o'clock there at the bottom. And uh, I'm at about half past one, and the blue squares are the peers that I know in my routing table. So the first thing I do is I ask the closest peers that I already know about in my routing table. Uh, the second thing is that they will reply with closer peers that they know from their routing table. And then this continues until somebody who's close to the target actually replies with, with either the value that I'm looking for or the lookup ends when uh, I can't find any nodes that are closer to the target key, in which case I will put the value uh, at those nodes. So how is this handled in the realm of async IO? Well, uh, a lookup is a sort of a future. Um, it's something whose results we can't yet know because, uh, well, not until we finish looking things up, and that might take some time. So in my distributor hash table, I just, um, I just inherited from uh, the future um, class. And the state of the lookup, uh, the progress of finding nodes close to the target is held within the lookup instance. And the lookup instance resolves uh, when we have an appropriate result. So 
the result for a lookup is either a value if I'm trying to get something, or a not found exception if I can't find it in the case of a get, or it's a list of the closest known nodes in the case of a put, in which case I know that these 20 or 30 nodes need to have this value. Okay. So what about networking? How does AsyncIO handle different networking protocols? How do nodes on my distributed hash table um, handle the down the wire aspect of the networking IO that I've been talking about? Well, we come to core concepts five and six, um, transports and protocols. So transports are provided by AsyncIO to handle TCP, UDP, that sort of level of the network stack. Um, and, uh, and the event loop sets these up so you don't directly um, deal with these. And protocols handle network protocols at the sort of application layer. So for example, HTTP or NetString, for example. So transports are concerned with how stuff moves over the network, whereas protocols work out what to do with the stuff sent over the network. Uh, they work at how to turn the raw bytes into something, um, some sort of a meaningful message, uh, such as a, a net string. Um, so really, all you need to know about, uh, all you need to work with, really, are protocols. Um, so here's an example um, from, from my code. Uh, my distributed hash table uh, is network agnostic, um, so it can communicate via HTTP or NetString or, or any other sort of protocol that I decide to, to implement. Um, and in this case, this is the NetString protocol, and all protocol classes must override the data received method uh, to handle incoming bytes. Um, and those of you who are familiar with Twisted uh, may notice that, uh, that this is actually taken directly from the way Twisted uh, does this sort of thing. Um, the way AsyncIO and Twisted work at this level, the, the uh, transport and the protocol, is very close. In fact, um, I believe that AsyncIO is based directly on how Twisted works this way. This is quite good because there's a lot of code in Twisted that I can then repurpose when I need to. So, some final thoughts. Twisted, I've mentioned already, so I love Twisted uh, in some sense, anyway. Um, I used an awful lot of Fluid Info, and uh, the original version of this distributed hash table was, was written in Twisted. Um, and rewriting in AsyncIO was a, a means for me to be able to learn all about AsyncIO. Um, and it feels very close to me, um, although AsyncIO feels uh, more lightweight and Pythonic than Twisted. Twisted has. Uh, it feels to me like it, it, it exists in a sort of its own twisted Pythonic universe, uh, which is, I believe, why it's called twisted. Um, so, if uh, if you're obviously using Python three, uh, use AsyncIO. But if if you don't have a choice, then I would suggest using twisted in two uh, in Python two. Um, my code actually has 100% unit test coverage, um, and testing is sort of normal. Um, in AsyncIO, for me anyway, um, although this obviously depends on how you organize your code. Um, so for example, Twisted has trial and, and uh, the actual implementation of their unit test um, module isn't quite the same as the, the classic unit test in, in Python. Um, also, my code that for the distributed hash table anyway is less than a thousand lines. In fact, it's about 890 when I last counted. Um, and so this is because AsyncIO makes it easy to think about concurrent problems. Um, and I believe the abstractions that it gives us uh, make it easy to write simple, short and comprehensible solutions like, like this distributed hash table. Um, and a final warning, really, uh, don't use AsyncIO if you need to do something with lots of CPU overhead, because obviously if you do that, you'll block the event loop. That's it. Uh, my DHT project is called The Drogulus. Uh, there's a GitHub link there. Uh, I'm Entol on Twitter. And I think we do have time for questions. Um, I put that image there after this morning's keynote. Thank you. If you have a question for the speaker, go ahead and line up at one of the mics. Hi. Hi. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Could you go back to the protocol slide? Why do you copy data into self? Just curious. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, because I'm lazy, and that's how Twisted did it. It's as simple as that. 
Hi, uh, thank you for nice talk. Uh, I has uh, never really use protocol objects uh, because it's very low level. Uh, I guess to use uh, async IO streams uh, for yeah. application code. Absol absolutely. So, like I said at the beginning, um, this isn't comprehensive, and I'm just trying to cherry pick the bits that are interesting for me that I used in in my DHT. So there is a um, a higher level. Um, API that you could use, the streams stuff. Yes, you're quite right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for the talk. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I've written a framework uh, using that's based on asynchronous operations with Gvent in Python 2 that I'm looking to port to Python 3 with async I.O. I was wondering if you were familiar with Gvent and if you know any limitations of async I.O. as opposed to Gvent. Um, I'm not familiar with Gvent, I'm afraid, uh, sorry. Well, I know what it is, but I've never had to code with it. Thanks. No problem. I have two questions. Uh, first one, I looked through the documentation for AsyncIO, and I find that the examples are uh, quite simple, and uh, I couldn't really figure out <coughs> from the official documentation protocols or how do I really extend it to uh, fit my needs. So do you know a good, good resource where I could actually understand the architecture in, uh, and uh, basically get a deeper insight into how to work with AsyncIO? Yeah, so there's a website called asyncio dot something org net or com or something like that. Um, and that has, a, that collects blog posts and presentations and things like that. Um, and I found that very useful when I started writing using asyncio. There's lots of really interesting blog posts and former PyCon um, presentations as video presentations too. So it's mostly a source code of other projects. That would be the uh, good way to go, I guess. Okay, so um, there's not a, there aren't a lot of projects using AsyncIO because it's relatively new, I guess. So um, uh, what can I say? <laughs> and the second question. AsyncIO.org. Yes. Okay. Thank you. When would the uh, when is a good choice to use AsyncIO? Is it kind of generic? Can I just start writing any program with it if I, that it's not really CPU bound and I just need some sort of a parallelism? That, um, you know, how long's a piece of string? Um, it depends on what the problem is, um, you know, how you're thinking about the problem. Um, I guess there's no really, not really any way for me to answer that question. It, it depends on what, on what you're doing, really. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, really funny, too. Cool. I have a, a fairly general question, and I don't know if it's a hard problem that a lot of people are working on or if it's fairly easy to answer. But how do you deal with async I.O. when you want to run on multiple cores on a machine and handle a lot of requests at once? Is it bad for that kind of use case? Or yeah, so it's, a, it's a single threaded application. Single threaded. Yeah. So you, you just want to give it one very powerful CPU yeah. and let it work? Yeah. OK, right. thanks. No problem. OK, looks like that's it. Thank you very much.